Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is our mountain bike tech related show where you ask the questions and we hopefully give you the answers you want. If you've got any questions, get them into the email address at the bottom of the screen there, or you can add them in the comments below. Use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech just so we know which ones are comments and which ones are questions. Let's get started. Now this one's from Riding with the Reeds. What is the best bike lock, um, preferably cable? Uh, I watched the Lock Picking Lawyers channel. Henny, he makes it seem like there's no such thing as a good lock. Um, that's a really hard question. What is the best lock? Well, it's certainly not cable lock because cable locks are going to be the, the easiest locks to, to break out of all the locks on the market. Of course, you can get chain locks, you can get D locks and U locks, all that sort of stuff. Um, it is hard to say because locks, Technically, they can all be broken. Uh, it's just how much time it takes to break them. Uh, so they're a deterrent. So really, you want to get the best lock that you can to make it as hard as possible for a thief or a would-be attacker to take your bike. The idea is you make your bike look a lot harder to steal than the one next to it, basically, on the street. Personally, I wouldn't really recommend a cable lock for anything other than being an additional deterrent lock to take with you. Uh, personally, the lock I use is a hip lock gold. So the locks are sold in bronze, silver, and gold rated secure settings. So um, you know, you know you're getting a maximum security with the gold on there. It's very heavy. I think they're about two and a half kilos, or well, certainly over two kilos, extremely heavy. But the whole point with hip locks is you wear them around your waist. And it doesn't involve having to actually close the lock mechanism. They've got a really cool buckle on them that clips shut. Um, very fast and effective to use, and because it clips around your waist, you don't feel that weight when you're riding your bike. Um, they've also got like a sheath on the outside of them that's reflective, uh, so it does mean they're safe in traffic as well. They're really good. And then there's the U-locks and D-locks, which again are fantastic if you can fit them to your bike where you have a, a bag suitable, but otherwise they're a bit, bit hard to carry around with you. Um, one point of advice I would say is don't leave your lock where you're locking your bike up unless you know it's a safe place where no one's going like, to basically do anything to it. Uh, we've heard horror stories about locks being tampered with when the owners have not been able to buy it. So when they next go to lock their bike up, it's easier for the thief to gain access to it. Um, so just bear that one in mind if you're leaving it out in public. Also, if you're likely to leave your lock outside for extended periods of time, you can suffer problems with corrosion. So if you do insist on doing that, make sure you spray lots of WD-40 or any sort of oily water displacer in the lock mechanism just to make sure it stays working smoothly and continues doing so. Uh, but yeah, check out the lock. Always get the best one you can and make sure you lock your bike up in obvious places. You don't want to lock it up around the corner in an alleyway where the thief or the attacker or whatever has some time to work on the bike. You want to make it as obvious as possible right outside a cafe where lots of people are looking basically where the bike is locked. Um, on the other side of some railings, basically anywhere that's a little bit tricky for them to nick the bike is your best bet. Um, but if possible, ideally try not to lock your bike up in public as much as you can. It's the only really safe way to go about stuff, unfortunately, these days. Ah, next one's from the Grim Reaper. I hope he's not knocking already, I'm not that old. What was the first part you broke on any bike? Did you get hurt? Was it under warranty? Do different colour bikes make any difference to your mood and riding? Do you prefer a certain colour? Have you ever had a bike stolen? Let's go backwards. Have I ever had a bike stolen? Thankfully not to date, but I really don't want to curse anything because I'd be absolutely gutted. Uh, and to be fair, I'd be really pissed off and I would make it my mission to find that person and really hurt them. Um, next one, do you prefer a certain colour? Um, no, I'll go through phases. Um, if I've got a bike that's say all black, I will love it and stuff, but I find that the next bike choice, I would want something the opposite um, and vice versa. If I've got a bike that's really bright, I quite like the idea of going for something quite subtle as but the next bike round. Um, honestly, don't. I really don't. I like a lot of colours. So, um, do different colour bikes make any difference to your mood or your riding? Um, absolutely none to me, but I'm sure it's definitely a factor for some people. Uh, some people, the colour of their bikes is absolutely everything to them. Um, I'd like to ask a few people that. In fact, anyone out there, if you ride an all black bike like the Murdered Out Stealthy Look, does it make you feel metal? Does it make you feel really cool? Let us know. Um, likewise, if you've got a really colourful bike, does that make you feel really happy and playful? Does the colour of your bike have any effect on your mood? Let us know down there. Um, yeah, cool. And the next one, what was the first part you broke on any bike? Did you get hurt? Was it under warranty? Um, bearing in mind I've been riding mountain bikes for quite a long time, the first parts I used to break was specifically left hand cranks and rear wheels basically and that was for 
Probably a bit of naivety on the way I used to ride a bike, but also the fact that the kit just wasn't up to spec. So left-hand cranks were always a problem because the cranks would be made of soft aluminium and the axles would be square taper made of a chrome molly steel axle. And if they got bashed or you fell off the bike, the simple bolt that would hold them in place there would sometimes come a little bit loose, enabling the crank to have a minute amount of movement and it wouldn't be enough for you to notice on that ride. And as the ride went on, basically you were basically moving the crank against that taper and that taper was slowly rounding out the inside of the crank. And by the end of the ride, you've got a crank that's all loose and sooner or later it would flip all the way around or basically it would be so bent and useless it would never tighten up properly. So you throw that one in the bin basically, get that down the recycler, get a new crank on. Uh, and for years, the square taper thing was a problem in mountain biking. Uh, I know there'll be a lot of you out there that will know about this from riding square tapers. Thank God those years are over too. Um, and the rear wheel thing, basically we were running rims made out of soft aluminium. They were too thin and they just weren't up to spec. And we were also riding in an era where you had to run your tires a lot firmer to stop getting punctures all the time. And we were running hardtails. Uh, trying to jump when we couldn't basically so the rear wheel was the first thing that just got all the abuse so years of buckled wheels and broken spokes and all that sort of stuff uh, and then I guess a rear derailleur um, quite common from crashing back in the day uh, as the years went on the things I broke got a bit more exciting like suspension forks and down tubes on frames crowns on forks stuff like that but um, I think everyone goes through a, a phase of breaking specific things um, yeah my memory of Growing up was left hand cranks and rear wheels. Bit boring, but yeah, yeah. Next one's from Beachy02. I'm thinking of designing a mountain bike frame for a college project. How do I get the threads into the bottom bracket? Is there a tool for making threads in frames? Or does this need to be considered when designing the frame? Um, well, you can get a tool. Basically, I'm gonna throw a picture of one on the screen. Park make them and various companies make them for basically chasing those threads through on a frame. So the best thing for you to do would be basically to invest in a part of the bike like one of these BB units. This is a blank that you would use as an insert on a carbon frame, but you can get various different ones out there and they have fairly coarse threads cut into them already for you to use. And then later when the bike is built, you would have to sort of face those surfaces to make sure they're completely square and flush. And you would use basically a BB tool to basically recut those threads to make sure the threads are fully accurate because the machines that do that aren't necessarily the most accurate in the first place. Um, that's quite advanced stuff as far as bike shop stuff goes, but it does make me laugh because we used to, I remember having to build up frames, you used to buy frames and do your own custom builds and you had to face everything on them. So if you have to face the head tubes before you put a headset in, which you don't really have to do anymore, you used to have to face the BB shell and you used to have to chase all the threads through to make sure they're good. We you had to remount seat tubes on bikes when seat, uh, the seat post was a little bit tight. You just don't really have to get that anymore. Um, I think that's quite interesting because frame manufacturing has got a lot better and that's part of the process of a delivered product. You get something that's literally ready to grease up the threads and screw a bottom bracket in. Um, yeah, so there you go. There's a tool for everything, but you won't necessarily need them. Uh, there's gonna be stuff open to you to use. Okay, another quick one from Quarantine Park. Hey Doddy, I've got some play in my coil fork. So when I pull the front brake, the bike can move forwards and backwards. Can I fix it or is it just my cheap fork? Uh, that takes all the abuse. Thanks for your help and I love the videos. Um, hi Carson, it's, I think it's probably your fork. Um, basically the cheaper the forks, the sort of the bigger the tolerances are when they're manufacturing them, um, which means it's easier to manufacture in the amount that they need to get them onto bikes. Um, basically, the more expensive the forks get and the more expensive the components get, the tolerances become very tight and everything becomes works a little bit better. So you're gonna to have to have some movement in, basically you have the upper leg, the lower leg, uh, which obviously slides over each other. And then you have bushes that basically support that and, and enable them to have a nice surface for them to slide against. Now the gap between the bushes and your upper legs is just gonna be slightly bigger. We're talking a, a minute amount here still than it will be on the higher quality forks, but that explains the wobble. Over time, that can increase and you might need to get the bushes replaced. Um, hopefully your fork is good enough that you can replace the bushes. If not, when they are worn out, then it might be time for a new fork, unfortunately. Uh, but don't worry about it, it's just part of the suspension fork. Even the best forks have some amount of movement in them. Okay, next question from Tom Luscombe. Currently sifting through all the debates about coil versus air. They all bang on about the suppleness and all the techie stuff, which I don't care about. What I wanna know is what's the most robust? I'm a heavy rider and air sharks have always worried me when bottoming out. 
Will the coil be more robust than air? Would the coil be less prone to damage? And what are the issues, uh, what are the issues when air versus coil shocks bottom out? Um, okay, yeah, fair enough. So you obviously know then that coils ultimately have the most supple response because they're not trying to override anything, it is just what it is. Uh, whereas air springs have to override the negative air charge basically to, for it to start working really well, which is why you see bigger air springs, bigger negative air springs that is, on modern suspension forks and shocks, and that's why they feel very supple and they work. Now, get it out of your head that bottoming out is a problem, it is not. They're designed to bottom out when they reach the end of travel, you will not damage them really, that is what they are designed to do. Um, at the same time though, coils definitely are a bit more robust. However, there are problems if you're both a heavy rider and you're heavy on your bike. Now, for example, Blake at a recent event, he couldn't actually get a coil spring heavy enough for the way he wanted to ride. Now, Blake's not an especially heavy person, but he likes his bikes like so firm for jumping and being really aggressive on them. He doesn't want it to wallow around too much. He wants it to feel more like a dirt jump bike, I guess, but in a format of a bike that can handle what he's doing. He couldn't actually get a coil spring to suit, so he ended up putting his Fox Float X2 back on the bike. It was absolutely fine. It's full of volume spaces, so it ramps up even more towards the end of the travel, and he's running it, I think, nearly at the max. Um, so that is absolutely fine, but it does accentuate the problem that there, there's a limit to the weight of a coil spring on the rear and a limit to the weight of a coil spring on a fork that you can get to suit different feels. Whereas air springs are almost infinite up to a certain point with rider weight, but they do all have an upper limit. Um, but I certainly wouldn't be concerned about it if I was you. I think it's fine, and unless you're like exceptionally large, it's generally not that much of an issue. Um, all manufacturers spec a max guideline on how much air their forks and shocks can take, and even if you're running it at the max, it will work fine. You will just have to make sure you dial in more compression and more rebound to control it. There we go, there's another weekly Ask GMBN Tech in a bag. Any questions, any comments, get them in below. If it's a question, please don't forget to use the hashtag AskGMBNTech uh, for a couple more great videos or some playlists. In fact, click down here for our Pro Bikes playlist. There's new ones being added all the time. And click down here for our Essentials series. That's the real basic stuff, basically helping you understand a bit about your bikes should you want to tackle some home maintenance. As always, don't forget to give us a huge thumbs up here at GMBN Tech and share and subscribe. Cheers, guys.